If those leaving the chamber could do so quietly, please. The next item of business is portfolio questions. And again, I would like to get as many people uh, to participate as possible. So short questions and answers, please. Question number one in the health and sport portfolio is Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to prevent passive smoking. Joe Fitzpatrick. We published our action plan on tobacco control, raising Scotland's tobacco-free generation in June 2018. The action plan sets out 15 measures which are intended to prevent the take-up of smoking, protect people from second-hand smoke and support people to quit. These measures will help deliver our ambition for a tobacco-free generation by 2034. All of them will reduce passive smoking. On second-hand smoke specifically, the action plan contains measures to ban smoking around hospital buildings and remove smoking from areas where children learn and play and from communal stairwells. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And uh, he sets out that the Smoking Health and Social Care Scotland Act 2005 does make it an offence to smoke in enclosed public places, but it doesn't specifically cover those children's play parks, the outdoor school facilities, or um, other programmes. And we know that the um, passive smoking effects are exacerbated in children um, due to their lungs not being fully developed. I would ask that. Um, the, if the Scottish Government have any plans to follow the Welsh Government um, who are enacting changes in the Public Health Wales Act 2017 to ban smoking in outdoor facilities and play parks. Joe Fitzpatrick. For, for the question, which I think is an important point. So the action plan um, includes a commitment to monitor the developments in Wales and also to monitor the implement, implementation of guidelines that we issued to local authorities in 2017. So we'll do that before we then consider whether legislation would be required. Um, and I think that's the, the correct way. The, as I said, the, the, the guidance was published in 2017. Um, so we would plan to engage with local authorities on the implementation later this year. Supplementary from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Designing Officer. Does the Minister agree that the Smoking Health and Social Care Scotland Bill passed in 2005 has been a resounding success with an 86% reduction in passive smoking in bars, 17% fall in heart attacks and an 18% decline in child asthma hospital admissions in the year following its introduction alone? And does he therefore agree it's time for the Tories to finally apologise for opposing this bill tooth and nail at stage one and stage three, given the thousands of lives saved since its enactment? Joe Fitzpatrick. There's no, no question that the, the, the ban um, had a, actually a very quick impact, and, and by the assessment in 2008, we very quickly saw that there was an immediate impact. I think further assessment will show um, a wider range of benefits from the, from the ban. Um, I, I, first of all, I think it's important to recognise the commitment of M Mr Gibson um, going right back into the, the, the first parliament on, on, on this issue. Um, and, However, I think on his, on his final point, I think we, we've, we've moved some, some distance from then. And I, and I think what I'm, what I'm hearing from the Conservatives in the Chamber today is support for this particular public health measure. So I think I'm, I'm more minded to, to try and work with the individuals here um, on this and other public health measures. I think if, if across the Chamber, um, the, these matters, and this is not the only one, the, the, the issue that we have around obesity, uh, alcohol and drugs are, are all other matters where I think we need to rise above politics and work together to do what is best for the people of Scotland. Question number two, Gil Patterson. Thanks, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported concerns of NHS boards regarding the possible impact of Brexit on their services. Jean Freeman. Uh, Scottish Government shares the concerns of NHS boards, uh, including on supply continuity, research and workforce. We continue to plan and prepare so we can minimise the impacts, but I need to be clear that we cannot remove or mitigate all the risks involved with Brexit. Alongside activation of our Scottish Government Resilience Room, we've established a health a uh, response hub to assist boards. We've written to EU staff and are supporting uh, those staff who are applying for settled status. Many medicine supply issues are outside our control, but we have established a medicine shortage response group and are working with NHS national services on medical devices stockpiling. Gil Patterson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? In light of the EU election result, which demonstrated that Scotland overwhelmingly rejects Brexit and in the backdrop of a potential new Tory Prime Minister crashing out, us out of the EU without a deal. 
Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what preparations the Scottish Government is making to protect our NHS in the event of a no deal? Jane Freeman. Well, of course, as the member knows, I've just outlined what those uh, preparations are. But let me repeat, we cannot mitigate all the impacts of a no-deal Brexit, which will see a significant shock to our economic system, which will, in due course, uh, produce additional demands on our health services with the end of freedom of movement. We know in health, and in particular in social care, then we will be severely challenged in terms of our workforce. And it is, of course, worth just saying before I finish, presiding officer, it is quite astonishing that in this century, in this country, we are busy working out how to feed and look after our citizens because we are being taken against our will out of the European Union. Question number three, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage the recruitment of GPs in rural communities. Jean Freeman. Uh, the new GP contract developed in partnership with the BMA is helping to reduce uh, doctors workload and make general practice a more attractive career in both rural and urban practices enhancing the GP role as expert medical generalists. We have in addition a, a package of measures to support rural general practice including significantly enhancing recruitment incentives and recruitment and relocation uh, uh, support. Uh, su supporting the Scottish Rural Medical Collaborative, investing in support for IT improvements to rural health boards and support for rural dispensing practices. Uh, even so, there are other issues around the flexibility of the contracts, which I take very seriously, and we will continue to consider how we can address these concerns. Michelle Ballantyne. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. However, it's clear that it's not working quickly enough. This week, Trinent Medical Practice in East Lothian took the decision to stop taking advanced bookings for GP appointments. They are quite clear about what has prompted this decision, an ongoing shortage of GPs within the practice, which has come about as a result of recruitment issues. The decision to halt advanced bookings has clear implications to the accessibility of GP services for local residents, particularly those who work during the week. So what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary offer me and the residents in East Lothian that other medical practices across South Scotland will not have to take similar measures to make up for the Scottish Government's failure to recruit and retain GPs? Jean Freeman. Well, of course, I don't accept the premise that the uh, member just ended with there. And I should say one of the greatest challenges in terms of retaining uh, our uh, workforce, in addition, of course, to Brexit, are the decisions that the UK government has made on pensioning increases, which are provide, produ, pro, proving exceptionally challenging across our health and care workforce. And if you don't believe me, go and ask those Royal Colleges, the BMA, who I'll meet later, and many others who have raised those matters with me. And if we only had the powers, of course, we wouldn't have made such a foolish decision in the first place. And if we ever had, we would reverse it now. What is happening with this contract, which of course is relatively new, is that as we need to recruit into those multidisciplinary teams in order to provide the right care for patients at the right point, then we are seeing in some, some areas, but not in all challenges, we are also seeing uh, NHS 24 uh, introducing itself to significantly improve matters, particularly now looking at Dumfries and Galloway. And it is, of course, our responsibility, along with our health and social care partners, where a GP practice is particularly challenged, to act immediately to try and intervene and support those patients. Uh, unusually in this session, I've got a question, and that would be, what part of short and succinct do members in this chamber not understand? Uh, so could we try and have some regard for all our fellow members and really take on short and succinct? Ian Gray, question number four. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that more young people and their families managing long-term health conditions can access art therapy. Claire Hockey. Art therapists are a small professional group, but they have a huge contribution to make in helping people of all ages to improve their general development, social interaction and communication skills, and to support mental and physical rehabilitation. As with other allied health professionals, access to art therapy is based on clinical need. Ian Gray. The Teapot Trust, founded by my constituent, uh, Dr Young, has gone from strength to strength and now provides art therapy in all of Scotland's children's hospitals, as well as Great Ormond Street and Alder Hay. 
they are also now working with some CAM services and would like to expand this. Indeed, I wrote to the Minister for Mental Health recently to ask if she would meet Dr Young and I, but she replied that she was too busy. The Trust today announced their new Chief Executive, Sarah Randall. Uh, I wonder if the Minister can be prevailed upon to find a half hour in her diary to meet myself and Ms Randall. Claire Hockey. Uh, I thank Mr Gray for his question. Um, I am well aware of the work that the Teapot Trust does and I congratulate uh, Laura Young on the work that she's done. From my own clinical practice, I'm well aware of the value that art therapists bring to all services, uh, both children and young people services and also to adult services. If the member writes to me again, I would certainly reconsider that as he is aware he has uh, been a minister himself. Sometimes diary constraints mean you can't meet everyone that you would like to. Short supplementary, Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, Deputy President, uh, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister provide an update on the numbers of art therapists working within CAMS? And also, what's the wider vision around access to um, therapy for services, not only in the NHS, but also in social care services? Claire Hockey. Uh, as I I'd said in my previous answer, obviously it's up to uh, NHS boards to determine staffing required in their areas based on their local need, but I recognise that art therapists can provide a valuable addition. I don't have the numbers that he has asked for, but I can uh, commit to writing to him with those figures. Question number five, Tom Mason. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve NHS Grampian's performance in meeting the 18 weeks referral to treatment target of at least 90%. Jean Freeman. As part of the Waiting Times Improvement Plan, additional funding to NHS Grampian has so far supported a new cataract procedure room, uh, which has uh, provided additional uh, patient treatment areas uh, and additional endoscopies. In addition, NHS Grampian is working with neighbouring health boards to maximise the use of capacity uh, with a focus on general surgery and urology to reduce the number of patients waiting the longest. Tom Mason. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Figures published yesterday show that rather than meeting the 90% target, Grampian's performance for patient journeys within 18 weeks has declined again to 61.7%. This is the single worst monthly performance for any health board in any month since at least January 2011. Does the Cabinet Secretary not agree this is shocking? Will she take the opportunity to apologise to the patients in Grampian? And will she admit that whatever grand plans and strategies she has are simply not working? Jean Freeman. Uh, on the contrary, uh, I uh, absolutely apologise to patients who are waiting too long for the treatment they deserve. It's not the first time uh, I've done that in this chamber, but I do not accept that our uh, plan and strategy is not working. What we need to understand is what I said in the Waiting Times Improvement Plan, it's there in black and white that we will focus on those who are waiting the longest. And in consequence of doing that, uh, and uh, as of March, uh, the end of March this year, the number of ongoing waits, i.e. those waiting the longest for inpatient and day cases, uh, has been reduced by 8.5%, the first quarter in nearly three and a half years where there has been that reduction. A consequence of that is when you focus on those waiting the longest, that those who are introduced into uh, the waiting times uh, will wait a bit longer. Inevitably, the plan makes it clear, it shows you in a graph, it, gets, it goes in that direction before it starts to improve. That's where we are. Nonetheless, that is not acceptable for uh, any of our patients who have to wait longer, and that is absolutely the focus of that waiting times plan, and we will continue to see improvement. Right now, we're on track to meet exactly where we said we'd be in October this year. Short supplementary, please, Monica. Thank you. Allegations of fraudulent use of previous government waiting time improvement funds are under investigation in NHS Lanarkshire. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of any other issue like this in Grampian or any other health board? And can she provide an update on the Lanarkshire situation? Jean Freeman. Uh, no other board has raised uh, these matters with us. Uh, and of course, they are all very aware and are looking at uh, making sure that whatever has happened in NHS Lanarkshire, that they have the right mitigation procedures in their own boards uh, to try and ensure that, that they are not vulnerable in that way. Nonetheless, the Lanarkshire uh, situation is the subject of ongoing investigation, and until that is concluded, I cannot comment further on it. Question number six, Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it's had with NHS Lothian regarding staff car parking at the Royal Infirmary. 
Jean Freeman. So just our discussions continue with NHS Lothian on this matter, which both the board and we take seriously. They have taken steps to increase and manage availability of spaces, uh, creating an additional 334 car parking spaces, which will be available from the 9th of July this year, introducing controls to limit car park use to those uh, accessing health services and staff with permits, undertaking discussions with travel providers on service provision to try and make sure that public transport uh, is more uh, appropriate for that particular site and the promotion of a pan-Lothian lift share program. The board will continue to engage with patients and staff and we will continue uh, to be in touch with them to see what more uh, in the way of constructive ideas for initiatives might be taken forward. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer? I've been contacted by a number of constituents who were employed at the hospital. Many are shift workers and are concerned about the cost of parking at work and their safety travelling to and from work since the parking permits have been revoked. Will the Minister therefore agree to refund the cost of parking? Jean Freeman. Well, of course, this matter has been raised with me uh, earlier, previously uh, by uh, the other member, Ms Graham. Um, we continue to discuss with the board uh, the allocation of staff permits uh, and the difficulties that may have arisen over uh, changes in those. And I'm very happy to update Mr Balfour as those discussions are concluded. Question number seven, Annabel Ewing. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on out-of-hours urgent care in Fife. Jean Freeman. Uh, I can advise a member that Fife Health and Social Care Partnership are still in the process of engaging with the community and hope to take proposals to the next integrated joint board meeting at the end of June. Annabel Ewing. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and whilst I appreciate it is of course important that all representations be duly taken into account, I am nonetheless concerned that matters are, are dragging on and uh, hopefully assuming that the Queen Margaret uh, Hospital in Dunfermline will be one of the sites selected, when will the new out of hours urgent care regime actually come into effect? Jean Freeman. Uh, <clears throat> I, understand, I understand the member's frustration. I also understand there are still a number of processes to go through before this reaches a satisfactory conclusion. However, I have received assurances from the Health and Social Care Partnership that assuming there are no further unplanned delays, the new out-of-hours regime should be in place before the winter of this year. A very short supplementary, Willie Rennie. An innovative solution has been developed for North East Fife and St Andrews. It means that people won't have to travel to Kirkcaldy unless there's exceptional circumstances. But there's been no provision overnight in St Andrews for a year now. The decision has been delayed twice. Can the Minister give us a guarantee that there will be no further delays? Jean Freeman. Uh, no, I can't give that guarantee. And of course, I'm aware of the innovative solution, given that the Scottish Government played a major role in brokering that innovative solution. I'm grateful to Mr Rennie for recognising that, I think. Um, what I can say is that there are proper processes that need to go through and the board and the local authority and importantly the IJB need to be given the time to do that in order to get it right. I can't guarantee that there will be no further delays but the, both the IJB and the re relevant partners are very aware of people's anxiety on this and desire to see what the conclusions are and they are equally aware of my desire to know that they are moving in the right direction, I hope that when they meet in June, they will be able to conclude on those proposals. Quick supplementary, Claire Baker. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will know that part of the delay was caused by the participation request being granted by NHS Fife, and this is the first time that piece of legislation has been used by an NHS board. Will she commit to deflecting on the experience of uh, individuals who went through that process? Because it is the first time it's been used, and NHS Fife had to seek legal advice about whether it was appropriate or not. Jean Freeman. Uh, yes, I'm very happy to um, have further discussions uh, with NHS Fife about the experience of that and to hear from those who went through that process and consider what more we might do. Right, we'll see if Ms Ruth knows what very short supplementary means. Jenny Ruth. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that it's vital the IGB continues to engage with communities and represent uh, residents in Glenorthis and to develop their plans further? Jean Freeman. Um, 
I think Ms. Gilruth raises an important point. I do agree. While an IJB may not be able to meet every request of a local community, I would expect them to clearly demonstrate how any plans they bring forward have been shaped by engagement with that community. If nothing else, in my opinion, it is a matter of simple respect towards the communities that any IJB serves. Question number eight, Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taken to reduce the amount of meat containing nitrites being served in hospitals. Joe Fitzpatrick. All hospital food must meet national food, fluid and nutrition standards. Under the NHS Scotland procurement framework, all suppliers must adhere to all relevant requirements, including those under the Food Safety Act as amended 1990 and Scottish, UK and EU food safety regulations. Liam Kerr. I thank the Minister for that answer. Look, the fact remains it's been four years since the publication of a report which linked processed meats, nitrites and bowel cancer. So does the Minister agree that this type of food should be nowhere near hospital menus and instead that high quality food produced right here in Scotland makes its way into Scottish hospitals? Joe Fitzpatrick. Um, I, I, I think the member might want to speak to some of the high quality uh, food producers who use uh, nitrates in Scotland. Um, which are um, uh, in, in line with um, food safety uh, rules and guidelines. However, on, on this issue, um, Scotland has led the UK by setting minimum standard of our hospital food. All hospital food has to, as I've said, meet the food, fluid and nutritional standards, and that takes account of the latest scientific advice on the amount of red and processed meat that can be consumed for a healthy balanced diet and um, so that is already no more than 70 grams of red um, and processed meat in a day. We'll now move on to the communities and local government portfolio. If we could organise ourselves quickly please, we are already um, ahead of time. No, we're not ahead of time, we're behind time. <laughs> Question number one, Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taken to tackle the rising levels of child poverty. Aileen Campbell. Uh, thank you. Scotland is the only UK country to have set statutory targets for reducing child poverty. Our Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan outlines the concrete actions we will take to deliver progress on those targets, and our first report due next month will set out in more detail the progress we have made. We are taking the, these bold actions in the face of the UK government cuts and austerity, which has seen the Scottish budget reduced by two billion in real terms since 2010-11, and we'll see 3.7 billion cut from social security spending by 2020-21, risking the progress that we've made. Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, all the evidence and all the projections suggest that child poverty in Scotland is going to continue to increase. And whilst I accept the point being made about the actions they are Tory government supported by the benches in here that poverty is rising. The fact is the Scottish Government have tools available to it to start to address this. Oxfam Scotland, for example, are arguing it's time to fast track Scotland's income, and income supplement. Will the government look at what powers it has and how it's going to use those powers and bring forward a statement to this parliament setting out what it intends to do in the short term to stop the increases, the unacceptable increases in child poverty in Scotland. Aileen Campbell. Yeah, I, as I said in my response, I um, will be updating uh, Parliament next month on the progress report uh, associated with the Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan. And, and within that plan, we committed to intro the introduction of the income supplement. Uh, and again, I'll be able to update the Parliament on the progress we've made on that particular point. But I think Mr Rowley should also recognise that uh, the Professor Al what Professor Alston said when he said that devolved administrations have tried to mitigate the worst impacts of austerity, uh, but mitigation comes at a price and it's not sustainable so we are doing what we can with the powers that we have investing the resources that we have to soften the blows of Tory austerity but it is not always sustainable to do that and we need to make sure that we raise the debate and are in a position where we can pursue our own policies to tackle the social problems that exist in Scotland so we'll continue to do what we're doing we'll continue to mitigate this and soften the blows of what the UK government are doing at Westminster and we'll continue to use the powers that we have to help children have the best chance and the opportunity to flourish and we can do so in partnership but I think we also need to recognise that austerity comes fairly and squarely and is recognised from Westminster. Question number two, Colin Smith. 
you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the level of new social housing building in Dumfries and Galloway. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, local authorities have the statutory responsibility for assessing housing need and demand in their area and setting out how requirements for housing will be met in their local housing strategies. Uh, Dumfries and Galloway produced its LHS in 2018, supported by a housing need and demand assessment, which was agreed as being robust and credible uh, by the Scottish Government in 2016. Uh, the Scottish Government will provide over £91 million in this parliamentary term for affordable housing in Dumfries and Galloway, and around 800 homes for social rent are expected to be delivered. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? One of the challenges facing the region in developing new housing is infrastructure restrictions. Developments in areas such as Gretna, Gretna Green and Springfield have been limited and quite challenging because of access to water supply issues. And likewise, in the Lockerbie area, there have been challenges about access to, to wastewater treatment works. So I could ask the Minister if he would agree to look into these issues to see what can be done across government to ensure that Scottish Water invests in the infrastructure needed to continue that growth in housing uh, in these communities. Kevin Stewart. Um, I thank Mr Smith for his question. Uh, I don't have to look into these matters uh, because I know exactly what is going on. Uh, there has been a huge amount of cooperation uh, between Scottish Water, uh, Dumfries and Galloway uh, Council uh, and uh, some of the housing associations, uh, particularly Cunningham Housing Association, uh, to resolve the problems uh, that exist in Gretna. Uh, I'm hopeful uh, that a solution uh, can be found to all of that uh, with that continued work in partnership. Uh, and in terms of other areas uh, around Dumfries and Galloway and around the country, uh, my expectation would be uh, that Scottish Water, who have moved a large amount of staff to look at the uh, frontline services and deliver uh, homes and businesses across our country, uh, would make sure um, that any barriers are, are taken down. That particularly works well uh, when there is cooperation, and I'm thankful to Dumfries and Galloway Council. Short supplementary, Emma Harper. Thank you. Um, given that the previous Labour government in Scotland only managed to build six houses in four years, would the Minister join me in congratulating Dumfries and Galloway Council and local housing associations, including Lorburn Housing, on the high level of accessible housing that they are providing to people across Dumfries and Galloway? Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Since um, 2007, uh, this government has uh, delivered 1,782 uh, social houses uh, in the Dumfries and Galloway area, uh, with many more to come during the course of this parliamentary term. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, we currently have uh, folks on site in Kirkconnell, uh, Dumfries, Annan, um, Dumfries, uh, numerous sites there. Um, what I would like to see in terms of delivery of uh, specialist housing um, is uh, many more. I've told local authorities uh, that uh, they should be using the affordable housing supply monies at this moment uh, to meet the needs of the people in their area, uh, and long may that continue. I understand from visits recently to Dumfries and Galloway um, that the site that I talked about in Ann Annan, which if I remember rightly, is the former Cars Billington site, uh, I think, if I, 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 I may be corrected here, but I think 15% of the housing in that site um, is wheelchair accessible. Question number three, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Land Commission's recent call for a fundamental rethink on the approach to land development. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, we welcome the Scottish Land Commission report uh, and will carefully consider their recommendations. Uh, our reforms could fundamentally reposition planning uh, as an enabler of high quality development, uh, particularly if Ms Beamish and others continue to work with me to get the planning bill back on track at stage three. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Minister for that answer and I note his, his um, remark about the planning bill. Um, the report calls for a collaborative approach for the government to accept the need for more public sector-led development so the risks and rewards of development can be shared between the public and private sectors. Um, does the Minister uh, agree with me that this need is very important and what action 
um, is he able to take to facilitate more public sector-led development, including on ensuring the right skills and resources are available to local authorities, and I quote from the report, to administer and drive the right outcomes? Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. I, I've been told to be succinct by you, um, so I'm not probably going to touch upon everything that um, Ms Beamish has said there. Uh, we accept all of the recommendations uh, in the report uh, in principle. Um, and we're already, uh, as Ms Beamish knows, committed to a significant uh, programme of work uh, following uh, the planning bill to get this absolutely right. Uh, you can be assured, um, uh, Ms Beamish can be assured, uh, that we will work with planning authorities, the development industry, the Scottish Land Commission, the Scottish Futures Trust and others uh, to draw up uh, proposals to address the re recommendations in the report. And as Ms Beamish well knows, I'm all in favour of cooperation. Short supplementary, Graeme Simpson. Uh, and on that note, Minister, would you uh, agree to uh, cross-party talks uh, as we take forward this important work? Kevin Stewart. Uh, as Mr Simpson well knows, because I'm meeting him, I think, in 20 minutes or so, I'm more than happy uh, to talk with uh, members from all parties. Question number four, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met COSLA and what was discussed. Kevin, oh, sorry, Aileen no, no, Campbell. It's myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ministers and officials meet COSLA representatives regularly to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. As part of that ongoing engagement, I have regular meetings with the President of COSLA to discuss issues of common interest. Our last such meeting was on the 13th of March when we discussed a number of issues, including Brexit preparations, and we will uh, meet again on Monday next week. Jackie Bailey. I wonder then on Monday next week if you would discuss the recent increase in local authority charges for social care, which have been breathtaking. In SNP-controlled Western Bartonshire Council, the cost of community alarms has increased by 100% and vulnerable older people are cancelling the service, more than 200 of them in the last month alone because it is simply unaffordable. Will the Cabinet Secretary work with COSLA to initiate a Scotland-wide review of social care charges to ensure they're affordable and invite Western Bartonshire Council Council to think again. Aileen Campbell. Well, I invite uh, Ms Bailey to write with the details and we'll certainly make sure that we pass those on to the relevant uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, and we can make sure that we can uh, engage on the round. But I do know that local authorities have uh, been treated fairly in terms of the budget uh, and that they have been given an increase uh, in the resource budget uh, when we pass the budget in this Parliament. So local government has been treated fairly and perhaps the, the discussion that Ms Bailey needs to have is with her local authority. Question number five has been withdrawn. Question number six, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the report of the fact-finding visit to the UK by the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Aileen Campbell. Uh, we welcome Professor Alston's report, which is a devastating analysis of the UK Government's austerity measures, describing the policies pursued since 2010 as retrogressive and in clear violation of the country's human rights obligations. The Special Rapporteur described the UK Government as determinedly in denial with regard to poverty in the UK. The role of national governments should be to tackle poverty and inequalities, not cause the deep damage outlined in this report. The Scottish Government agrees with the Special Rapporteur's assessment that the UK Government must reverse the many policies it has pursued that are increasing poverty and inequality and imposing regressive measures. Colin Beattie. I note the Rapporteur pointed out that Scotland is mitigating the worst impacts of UK Government austerity. But, and I quote, mitigation comes at a price and is not sustainable, unquote. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree if the UK Government doesn't reverse its harmful policies, then it's time that Scotland had the powers to do so herself? Aileen Campbell. Yes, we do. I mean, we invest £125 million to, as I've said to Alec Rowley, to soften the blows of Tory cuts and Tory austerity. And Mr Beattie is also right to say that Professor Alston said mitigation comes at a price and is not sustainable. So we cannot mitigate the £3.7 billion gap in welfare spending caused by UK government cuts. I'd far rather we pursued an approach to welfare and social security based on dignity and respect. The building of a new social security system gives just a glimpse of what we can do with the powers that we currently have. Just imagine what we could do in the future that we could create if we had the normal powers of an independent country to help care for those who need it most. Question number seven, Joanne Lamont. 
Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Glasgow City Council and what was discussed. Aileen Campbell. Ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including Glasgow City Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. In relation to Glasgow City Council, I was delighted to see that equal pay settlement offers started going out uh, to claimants last week. The unfair treatment of many female employees at the Council was allowed to go on for far too long, and I welcome the action the City Council has taken to resolve it. Yeah. Johan Lamont. Thank you. I wonder if the Minister is aware of Glasgow City Council's Education Committee passed a motion calling for primary one tests to be scrapped and that the full Council this month agreed that teachers should be able to make their own decisions regarding testing and indeed passed a vote of no confidence in education. Convener, what advice would the Cabinet Secretary give to Glasgow City Council in implementing that democratic decision? And when Will your government start listening and respect the decision of this parliament that primary one testing should be scrapped? Aileen Campbell. I, again, I will certainly will con make sure that those uh, points that Ms Lamont make are passed on to the relevant department, the education department, but I would uh, point out uh, again that uh, Glasgow City Council uh, endeavours to improve outcomes for the, for the children that are in their care and make sure that they have good, high quality uh, education, a commitment that I know that my colleagues in Glasgow City Council take very seriously uh, indeed. Question number eight, Neil Bibby to ask the Scottish Government when it last met COSLA to discuss local government finances. Aileen Campbell. The, the Scottish Government meet with COSLA on a regular basis to discuss a number of issues, including local government finance. Neil Bibby. Uh, the SNP and Greens in this chamber are pro proposing local government has the power to raise revenue through the workplace parking levy. Earlier this year, the Finance Secretary admitted there had been no economic analysis done on this policy. Has that now been done? Aileen Campbell. Uh, the, we're working there on an agreed uh, Green Party, uh, supporting an agreed party amendment to the Transport Bill that would introduce the, the power to enable local authorities to introduce a workplace parking levy. But it's important to recognise that this would be a valuable additional tool for local authorities who choose to use it. Yeah. It is not mandatory. And also, it's also in res response to the ongoing climate emergency that has been uh, talked about and yeah. discussed for some time, but requires now to have action that follows it. So um, again, you know, I'm sure there will be much more uh, engagement on, on this particular issue as the transport bill passes through the parliament. But you know, if Mr. Smith wants to tackle climate change, then he should uh, look to see what he's actually going to do, as opposed to carking from the height sidelines. Yeah, yeah. That concludes portfolio questions and we'll move on to the next item of business.